across our nation, schools celebrate Read Across America with guest speakers and fun activities. At Chesapeake High School in Pasadena, Maryland, we celebrated our 11th annual Day of Reading with authors, artists, astrophysicists, and even a former NFL football player. Sit back, relax, and enjoy our 2018 Read Across America event. Hello, I am Amber. Today I will be introducing Ming Diaz. Ming Diaz is a storyteller face painter who has been working as an electrical engine, electrical technician for the past 35 years. Ming is multi-talented and is a communications expert. Today he will be talking about the importance of communication and sharing techniques because he believes that communication is one of the most important skills to have for the future. So ladies and gentlemen, Ming Diaz. At this time of the morning, congratulations. You all look re remarkably lifelike. <laughs> Any questions? OK, that's, you know, that's usually making my life easy when I ask that and not worry about a particular thing to talk to, except, of course, the subject for today, reading. Mandatory reading sucks. Reading for pleasure most of the time does not, not because you're the one who ended up choosing what you want to read, but because you get surprised. You get some wicked, wicked moments. Picking up a book out of boredom, five hours later, it's two o'clock in the morning, you're still not ready to go to sleep and the book is about three quarters done. Oh yeah, I can finish it if I sleep. get to sleep at four o'clock in the morning, no problem at all. I'll be able to make it the next day in school. <laughs> can I get a witness? <laughs> Somebody would recognize doing things like that. It's foolish, but it's such a huge payoff. Two things I want to get across. One of them will be kind of oblique. The first one is as simple a statement, which I hope someday you will put in bill poster size type across the inside of your forehead. Never, never, never forget this. You may have already heard it. The person who reads is always the person who is ready. In the job market, I have spent the last 28 years at the facility where I just retired, every summer I would receive high school and college level interns, usually five, maybe seven throughout the summer. My specialty has always been electronics, microcircuit repair, fiber optics, and cable design. Would you be su surprised to know that the cable system throughout, for instance, a aircraft like a 747, 757 is designed at 100% scale on tables, they're called Pomona tables. You have to know the exact to the quarter inch position of every single connector on that cable harness, where they go, how they're distributed, the way they're connected, the function of that connector. All this stuff done on a table long before some group comes along, disconnects the cable from the table, picks it up on their shoulders because sometimes the center of the harness can be that big around and they do the hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to the aircraft we go to install it within the fuselage. Before the aircraft starts going together, the cables have to be pre-designed. Every cable ever built for an aircraft is built on a table layout. The only way you will ever learn that particular job is that you must, without fail, spend time reading the specifications so that you are comfortable with saying, oh, okay, as I'm designing this cable, building it along in this direction, I get to this one connector, this wire that's supposed to go in there is supposed to be red, and it's supposed to be X diameter. Oh, gee whiz, it's not. Someone will inevitably come along in the professional world when you find a mistake because you have been doing reading, that's the theme of this presentation, because you have been doing reading and you know the specification for that wire at that connector is not right. Someone will inevitably come along and say, 
hey, not a big deal. We don't have to mess with it because if you take out that wire and add a correction, we're going to have to walk about half a football field that way to take it completely out of the harness, run it off of another system. <laughs> yeah, you're the one taking it out, by the way. <laughs> Uh, I'd rather you didn't bring up the subject. Now, this comes to the second thing that reading will emphasize for you in your lifetime. I'm witness to this. And I learned it the hard way because I got fired from two jobs when I didn't do this particular rule. Here's the rule. Your professional career is going to be like playing soccer in a World Cup. And there are no time out moments. If you ever have what it takes to walk out onto a game field at World Cup level, and that's your professional job, the job that you will someday be working at or working in in order to get someplace else. You don't have to take a job out of high school and stick with it for the next 55 years till you reach doddering retirement like me. <laughs> no. If you ever get to a situation in the professional world, and you will because that's how you earn your income, where you must without fail every single day Bring your A game, because if you don't, you will not have that job. You will be doing your very best every single moment of that working day. I tell you categorically about rule number two. The only thing that ever made my job secure, the only thing that ever made me worthwhile in my career, was reading. After graduating from college and after graduating from active duty military as an electronics tech, I have spent every day of my professional career going to professional websites. When the internet came along, I said, oh my, it's party time. I can actually spend my time goofing off in front of the computer and get paid for it. But the goofing off part was reading trade magazines, reading petrochemical magazines, reading... How many of you know that website, Clients from Hell? You don't? Oh my, especially if you're in IT. Yeah, raise your hand because if you have been exposed to it. If you're in IT in your future career, <laughs> you want to read this website because it will tell you everything there is to know about the very worst that can happen to you in your future lifetime as a working professional, someone who's earning income. Clients from Hell is a abject and exceedingly clear lesson in what you will run into that you never want to encounter. It will wreck your life if you have one of these things happen to you on a single day's worth of work. But back to the World Cup simile. I have taught interns for 28 years, spring break throughout the entire summer employment season and then sometimes during Christmas break. Of the probably 250 to 270 interns I have had over the years, I can probably count on the fingers of two hands young people who have come in with what I call, politely, the I care attitude. Because they know they have been taught or they have read about the things that go into the professional world, what they have done is started showing up at work 15 minutes early. What they have done is take a break or not, depending on what they have to do to get the job done. What they have brought with their eye care attitude is, you know that wire I was just talking about that goes to that connector that's not the proper size or color code? They did not accept someone saying to them, leave it alone, it's good enough. 
you don't accept good enough in the professional world. You read, you learn your job, you are involved enough that when something comes along that is not right, or if you know that you can do it better, which happens to be known as a beneficial suggestion, and in most companies that puts money in your pocket as a bonus. When you read and you know your job better, you will end up doing the things that makes you the player in the World Cup scene. So I've just given you in less than 12 minutes a synopsis of what the professional world is like as far as I'm concerned. You care, you bring your A game every single day without fail. By the way, how many of you envision doing a, a career for the rest of your professional lives that is boring every day? Don't hesitate, raise your hand. I expect you to uh, have the best of all possible. Yeah, nobody does that. Nobody in their sane mind does that. What turns you on? Besides that, here are the criteria. What turns you on? What have you done so far? What have you discovered such that you forget to get up from the chair for six hours? When you do, you just suddenly realize you forgot to go pee. You suddenly realized you did not go get a drink of water. You suddenly realized you were so wound up doing that thing that you just discovered is very, very interesting. That you forgot about time. What turns you on? And by the way, if the answer is I don't know, that's perfectly valid because I did not discover my passion until I was 35 years old. I have been an electronics tech for 55 years. That is my joy and my pleasure. At 35, I discovered my passion when I started reading and tried face painting. Go ahead and laugh. At 85 bucks an hour, I'm crying all the way to the bank. And that's my minimum fee. Face painting. What turns you on? I was reading in a professional clown magazine, and the thought occurred to me, I have been ballooning for 22 years. My hands were tired. I was physically tired. I was tired of getting into a clown outfit that took me two hours to get ready before I drove to the gig, however long that took. And then I did the gig, and then I had to drive home in the makeup another hour to take it off. So I tried face painting because the whole time I was sitting in a chair playing real close to the child, making them feel good because I was performing the anthropological function called grooming. By the way, look it up. When you're grooming someone, you are enhancing them. You are making them feel good. You are telling them they are ferociously important. I was enhancing a child's life. I was not physically wearing myself out. And I was getting 85 bucks an hour. Rough life, huh? And all that from reading. Nah, 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 nah. Serious. Serious. I have had every window in my life open to me because I just happened to be reading. And by the way, that was online. It wasn't a book. Bring an I care attitude to what you do. If you care enough, you will make the effort to research, learn, enhance yourself, make yourself better. Most of that is done by reading, not just on the job training. and then get turned on. Do the thing that turns you on. Do the thing that is, by the way, the modern terms are either you are involved in your bliss or you are in your flow. How many of you have heard those terms? 
really works. Find that thing. Other than that, <laughs> you end up looking like me, a decrepit 66-year-old, slightly overweight, who's still face painting as a career. Gee, rough life. Any questions? Did I answer any of your questions that you didn't even ask? Of all the things I could get from feedback, of all the things I could put in between your ears this morning, the fact that I presented you with some ideas you didn't think of to begin with, that's the reason for Read Across America. That's the reason for my particular point of view. I'm up here making the old fat boy noise because I've discovered the things that turn me on. I have spent every single day in my professional career, either electronics, teaching, or face painting, at play. I don't think I've ever worked a single day in my life. Serious. Every single day, I got up and headed out the door with an attitude of, oh, 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 I have some things in my, my wife hates my guts because of that, because she wakes up looking like the cat dragged in. But it has been my entire working career. For those of you who have known me that I have been here at Chesapeake High School for 18 years, that has been my entire reason for existence. I want this for you. Because if not, what you will have is exactly what Ralph Waldo Emerson said is the bane of the existence of everybody on the face of the earth. The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. They get up, they do, they are hopefully responsible, and then they go back home at the end of the day with, okay, I gotta do this again tomorrow. Don't do that. Don't do that. Last chance. Questions? If you could, would you do it over again? Yes and no. Thank you. In fact, intelligent questions. Catch. Oops. OK, someone will get it to you. I pay off for smart questions. Oh, I didn't tell you that, did I? Gee, watch what's going to happen next. OK, would I do it over again? The answer is yes and no. <sighs> I am the father of two exceedingly generative young people. The oldest is 36, now the youngest is 31. I am lucky to have simply been the daddy standing behind the mommy who was the one who raised our children, reared our children is the proper term. It worked. It worked, both of them were honor students, both of them were uh, National Honor Society, both of them have careers. One is a OR nurse. He's really, really spun up about his work, enjoys it every day. The other one is mother of two. She majored in communications. Where did she get that bad habit? Yeah. Those are the things I would not change. Would I change the stupid stuff that I did, especially when I was active duty military, especially before then, when I was a teenager living by myself in Spain, especially, um, pick a stupid something. I'll let you know if I did it or not. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> now that I'm 66 and I no longer have a government clearance, let's talk later, right? But, but back then. But the things that detracted from my life due to my own actions, I would really, really like to go back and do again with an understanding just how stupid I was. Fat chance. We don't get do-overs. The thing, by the way, that bailed me, and again, sort of fits the criteria of this presentation, I have had in my life an inordinate number of people, both young and adults, peer and older who have helped me do better. They did not pull me down. 
Who you hang with is as much of an importance as who you are married to and who you end up working for, which will enhance your life. That's a decision I really would like to go and do over. The rest, I like face painting. <laughs> I really do. Questions? Go. Did you feel like you to do keep on working? Oh, my. <laughs> Did my children encourage me to keep on working? The more they had me out of the house, the happier they were. Serious, because otherwise I was in their shirt pockets, especially during high school. Do you know how much that sucks? I was in the high school theater group helping as an adult tech. I was in the communications classes teaching part time. Every chance I got, both of my children were band geeks. I was one of the band parents cruising around with them, going to the different band performances. They did not want that. They encouraged me to, yes, go to work, which was not a problem because I enjoyed my work very much. And then when they needed me, does that answer your question? Yeah. Questions? <coughs> Here's your dollar. <laughs> the question, why is communications? <laughs> okay, the question from Ms. C was, why is communications important? Oh boy. Here, I'll give you the simple and then I'll give you the complex. Somebody tell me to shut up. Well, by the time I overrun it. Here's the simple rule. If you fail to make communications the most important priority in your life, everything else you will ever do, personal and professional, will be at risk. Here's the simple version. If you fail to communicate properly, everything that will come your way or that you will try to do will suck just a little bit more because you will not have the skill to come across to the other person who needs to know what's between your ears, or you will not be able to get the ideas that are trying to be taught to you. Communication is one of the premier foundation stones of anyone's personal and professional existence. That's the rule. Here's the long version. Before I was helping some professional level communications classes. They're called effective executive speaking. With a PhD who taught these classes for 20 years where I worked at Pax River, I was his assistant. I really didn't care whether I communicated or not because my job was in a lab with a fistful of guys who were my peers. We were doing the job, finishing at the end of the day, having a good time in the process. Hey, what more do you want? Blue collar me. After I learned the concept of communication, I started getting across little problems like that wiring, little problems like needing a series of parts. Each one of them cost something like $800. They were not coming in. I had to be the one to communicate to not only the vendor, but to a national distribution center. This is the part number. This is what we need. This is what we are willing to do to get it. What will it take to have that thing FedExed in a box, put on my desk Monday morning? People who can't communicate can't do that kind of stuff. My communication skills were sit still, shut your mouth, and listen when my children were talking to me. My communication skills were to say, after my wife lets me know what's on her mind, yes, dear. And it's not being facetious, it's being serious that I got the message from the other person who happens to be the most important person in my life, who also happens to be the mother of our children. It's the communication skills that bailed me out from doing stupid things. Somewhat. Communications is the, if not, excuse me, is one of the premier foundation stones to who you will be in the future. If you fail to make an effort to learn how to communicate, 
you're going to fail in so many other things in your life. Last question? Guys, we're done. Bless you because you happen to be the hope of our next generation. Don't stop. <laughs>